Hello, everybody. Um, since it's a, it's a minute after four, I would like to get started. So as you take your seats, we will start uh, our Bowie lecture session for 2018. Welcome, everybody. We typically start this by not starting with the Bowie lecture, but actually starting with one of the Geodesy section awards. So we will give the citation and hand out our Geodesy section Ivan Mueller Award, which is our award for distinguished service to the Geodesy community. And our president-elect, Megan Miller, will read the citation for this year's Ivan Mueller Award. Thank you, Sue. It's my great pleasure to recognize Dr. Richard Gross, the 2018 recipient of the Ivan I. Mueller Award for Distinguished Service and Leadership. My citation draws directly from letters of nomination by Professor Veronique de Hunt, and the letter supporting the nomination received from Professor Zuhair Altamimi, Thomas Herring, and Harold Shu. The award is given in recognition of Dr. Gross's outstanding and tireless service to the international geodesy community. Dr. Gross is an extraordinary ge geodesist, a respected leader who has promoted geodesy within AGU and within other international scientific organizations over the past 30 years. Dr. Gross very much demonstrates the dedication to international service that Ivan Mueller epitomized. Richard is one of those rare individuals whose expertise spans all aspects of his chosen field of study, from observations, via analysis, to theory. For nearly two and a half decades, he has been the intellectual leader behind the JPL combination and prediction of the Earth orientation parameters that are needed for tracking and navigating interplanetary spacecraft. The universal time and the length of day predictions produced at JPL under Dr. Gross's leadership are currently the most accurate available. The quality of these predictions done by the common filter software developed by Dr. Gross and his team has undoubtedly contributed in no small part to the success of JPL's interplanetary missions. Richard's central guiding principle is to seek the best obtainable results from the analysis of space geodesy data and their applications in geosciences. Richard is a well-known expert in Earth rotations. This is a domain that Professor Ivan I. Mueller cherished during his career for its fundamental importance, not only for societal applications, but also for understanding the dynamics of the Earth system. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Gross. Thank you very much. This is a very great honor for me. It's especially gratifying to receive an award in Ivan Mueller's name, who, who um, I remember very fondly through the years for his guidance and um, scientific leadership. Thank you very much. I'd like to now introduce our 2018 Bowie lecturer, Byron Tapley. Byron is a professor of aerospace engineering at the University of Texas at Austin, where he served as director for the Center of Space Research from 1981 until just this year. UT Austin was also where Byron started his illustrious academic career, getting his bachelor's, his master's, and his PhD in engineering mechanics at UT. You must really like UT. <laughs> Byron was, it was instrumental in establishing the field of satellite altimetry in 1980 to monitor ocean circulation and global sea level rise. Since 1997, he has served as the mission principal investigator for the Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment Mission, better otherwise known as GRACE. GRACE ended its 15-year operational phase this year, but don't worry, GRACE follow-on also launched this year, guaranteeing the science community many, many more years of gravity data. 
Over the years, Byron has won many awards and served on many influential committees, important for earth science and geodesy. I don't want to take away from too much time from his lecture, so I just want to hit a few of the highlights. So Dr. Tapley is a fellow of several professional societies, including AGU and AAAS, as well as the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. He's won several NASA awards, including the NASA Distinguished Public Service Award and the NASA Exceptional Scientific Achievement Medal. He's also won the AGU's Charles Witten Medal, the medal that AGU gives out for outstanding achievement in research on the form and dynamics of the Earth and planets. Most recently, he served as a steering committee member for the 2017 Decadal Survey. And finally, this is the one I'm sure he's been waiting for, he was selected as AGU's Bowie lecturer. Byron will be talking to us today about gravity as a measure of climate change. Please welcome Byron Tapley. Thank you very much, Sue. Uh, in looking around the, the uh, audience here, I think probably we could have not used that introduction version here. There's so many colleagues and friends that I've seen looking into it. The presentation today uh, is going to be a mixture of essentially what could be uh, looked at as uh, relevant to the gravity as a measure of climate change. Uh, it'll obviously be centered around uh, the contribution of grace in the gravity role. And there will be some introductory comments in there, which those of you who have been with us for most of the uh, time frame will find repetitive. But uh, I think for those of you that are here for the first time over here may be informative on that. The topic that we are working with on this essentially looks, starting with uh, wrestling with the question of the uh, Earth system, looking essentially predominantly at trying to understand how the uh, central components, the atmosphere, the ocean, land surface, and the cryosphere, and the solid earth all interplay to try to uh, look at the uh, way energy, mass, momentum, exchange, uh, work forward on it. Water is one of the principal uh, components in this version over here, and it'll be one that'll dominate a good bit of what we're saying here. Uh, it's a surrogate, essentially, for the mass that we'll be talking about throughout that, although there are substantial and important uh, solid Earth mass movement signals that play in that. Uh, to understand the interactions of these particular components, uh, you need accurate global and uh, synoptic measurements. You need to look at the Earth, whole Earth at one point. You need accurate measurements, and you need global measurements. And looking at that set of three very demanding requirements, the global being very, uh, very uh, demanding in terms of the requirements, the satellite measurement proves uh, to be the only feasible uh, means for satisfying the global and the near synoptic uh, going forward. Uh, and we'll look essentially at the role of the satellite in this mass movement mode. And trying to go forward with that, the connection between this and the actual title is that the um, uh, measurement of gravity essentially is a surrogate effectively for the mass movement. We note that the Earth mass varies uh, as we move around on the surface of the Earth. It also varies as time changes at any one given point. And that mass has a gravitational effect. A mass point through Newton's uh, law of gravitation would have a signal on another mass point. Um, either the position changing or the time changes causes the signal to, uh, to vary. And the concept that we've worked with in terms of putting the mission together is that repeated global measurements of gravity uh, can be used to look both spatially and temporally variation of the Earth's mass. That is, you need global data sets, repeated global sets, and one essentially can separate those two components. Uh, generally, the gravity signal associated with the spatial mass variations is much, much larger than the temporal variation, but most of the concern that we had in the first side uh, in the temporal variations uh, falls in these smaller signals with the water movement. Uh, the gravity-induced signal uh, varies from um, uh, the, the variations. turns out to be what you'd use an essential measurement for understanding the process involved in Earth system dynamics. And it's made a case for this being listed when one sets down the essential climate variables. It's not in that actual list yet, but it's the one that uh, should be considered when we start putting those down. Uh, the 
the story essentially for this starts back essentially with, uh, with uh, the time frame when we were wrestling in the 80s with time variable gravity. The uh, global signals that were available essentially were obtained in the changes in the uh, oblateness of the Earth, uh, changes in the uh, uh, position of the reference frame that we described the uh, uh, points going on the surface of the Earth with respect to the center mass of the Earth and the actual uh, movement of the uh, polar motion, all mass-induced signals. In the uh, late 80s, early 90s, we had just this version of the trend that we were looking at, and we were essentially explaining most of what we saw in terms of an annual variability, which we assumed to be water in some form, and a trend going down, which was attributed to be the uh, glacial isostatic adjustment associated with the North American continent. Uh, Roughly in the, uh, there's a, this essentially results are obtained from satellite laser ranging of the Lagios uh, or the Cannonball Cluster. It's, um, for those of you that are not aware of it, the uh, Lagios satellite essentially looks sort of like a golf ball. It's a round satellite, very dense, at a very high altitude, and it's covered with cube corners so that any time the satellite uh, sends a signal to it, it's turned around and sent back to the ground base. Uh, there was essentially the accuracy with which the results are picked up here, shown here, up until around the uh, early part of 1980, late 78 and early part of 1980, the uh, laser system was uh, essentially in a, uh, uh, an implementation mode. Uh, the Mobilis uh, proved the accuracy very dramatically, and then the early part of 1990, the uh, um, Lagos 2 was placed on orbit, and we saw fairly uh, substantial improvement in the uh, precision of the measurements and it's been maintained throughout the remaining time frame. Around the early part of 90, we began to see a deviation from this particular point and the community at large began to talk about the uh, initial melting in the polar ice sheets and we began to attribute in this point. There was a, a early uh, mid uh, 90s paper pointing out a major effect in this J2 due to uh, uh, polar ice cap melt, but it turns out this was related to an El Nino event in which uh, the mass increased and then came back to this uh, changing trend from the um, uh, GIA-induced figure, but uh, ran through this time frame. And then there has been what appears to be acceleration due to the, um, to the melting of the ice sheet. It's all essentially uh, forming this. And so if you have this, uh, this uh, signal with a mixture of phenomena that, we're, that we are aware of on the surface of the Earth, uh, but uh, very little way of essentially understanding the what, the where of the actual events that contribute to the signal we're looking at here. For instance, the water, if it's changing this much, uh, where's, if it's leaving the ocean coming in, where's it going to? Uh, what about, the, or where's the ice sheet melting from? So we actually had no pre uh, way of picking this up. There is a support mode in terms of the center mass motion, essentially, that uh, essentially maps this XYZ coordinate shift of uh, the coordinate frame with respect to the mass centers also is a very large mass signal. And in the, um, the trend, we're looking at the pole, this is uh, generally attributed to the uh, GIA to someplace around the 2003-2004 uh, uh, time frame in which there was a shift that was attributed again to possibly to the polar ice melt. So these large signals essentially suggested that there is mass involved the mass movement. These mass events that we're talking about here are the consequences of and are related to climate type trends and the, the case for trying to understand where they're coming from sort of uh, made its case going forward. And this led essentially to the uh, thought process for the GRACE mission. It was essentially at this background in the middle of 95 when we put together the, uh, the uh, GRACE study. The, scenario that one looked at is this, this cartoon we see very frequently that talks about the sun essentially heating the ocean, the uh, uh, evaporation putting moisture in the atmosphere, the atmosphere transporting it, some of it falling back into the ocean, some of it falling as frozen precipitation or as rather liquid participation, and then over a given time frame making its way back into the ocean. The uh, suggestion of trying to essentially come up with a way of coming up with regional type measurements that would allow us to actually look at what's happening to the mass, not only on the ocean, but on the land. And in the concept we put forward, not only that, but what's uh, happening to the, uh, to the deep ocean part that goes forward. The uh, uh, um, original studies that were put forward, I think this is something that uh, Srinivas Bedapur and Richard Eanes did as input to uh, the satellite, the gravity and geosciences uh, 
a report that came out of the decadal survey calling essentially for a gravity mission and talked about a lot of the time variable phenomena that we uh, 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 set forward in the previous slide. Uh, you'll note that there was three essential possible implementation modes looked at. Uh, one of them was essentially built on the gravity gradiometer. One essentially proposed the satellite-satellite tracking, and one was the satellite-satellite interferometry. The fourth was essentially the GPS uh, type, uh, uh, type measurement that uh, uh, was a single satellite version. Uh, the, we essentially looked at the accuracy that which one could pick up from those particular components. The implementation of uh, all three of them came to pass in the so-called decade of the uh, geopotential mission. A CHAMP was launched first with Chris Reigber essentially as the principal investigator and putting it on orbit. And it was a gravity plus a geopotential mission. Uh, we brought essentially the uh, the GRACE online in a short time frame after that with Chris joining in the, as a, a co-PI to try to help get the mission off the, uh, off the base on that. And then the, uh, uh, the GOCHE mission that ESA flew in the uh, late part of the 20 decade uh, was a lower flying satellite focusing on the uh, gravity related to the mean field. Uh, it's interesting to note that this uh, satellite, satellite interferometry essentially is essentially being implemented on the uh, GRACE follow-on measurement along with the standard satellite, satellite microwave instrument going forward on that. So of the concepts that were studied here at the present time, we'll see all of them on orbit and we're looking at what one can do with those. The, uh, uh, concept in the measurement for those of you that goes forward essentially has two satellites flying one behind the other and being influenced by a mass element on the surface of the earth. The total picture is a whole host of mass elements, but this assumes that the one over r squared distance in, in Newtonian gravitational attraction would cause the leading satellite to be uh, attracted in a stronger fashion and would accelerate away from the, from the uh, uh, second satellite. Uh, so as it moves forward, it would have a separation from it. And then if one continues on past that, when it's, it goes past this, this one is being slowed down as the second one is accelerated. So one gets an expansion contraction mode that's a response to this particular mass element. That expansion contraction, the magnitude of it is uh, proportional to the magnitude of the uh, mass attraction. So this particular uh, concept essentially was the idea that we used to put the mission together. The idea would be to essentially overfly the surface of the Earth uh, uh, once every uh, uh, 30 days and essentially take that collection of measurements to come up with a solution to the gravity field. Uh, the uh, slides here essentially shows it in a little bit more form. The positioning of the overall mission essentially is based on uh, using the GPS satellite configuration to locate the satellites at a point, a geographic point over the surface of the Earth. The, uh, high accuracy inter satellite ranging system essentially gives the measured uh, differential response to the mass elements. The uh, additional information requires uh, accurate accelerometer on board each satellite to pick up the uh, surface forces from radiation pressure and from um, the uh, atmospheric drag coupled with any translational accelerations that are residuals of the uh, attitude control system. Uh, this information is all provided in a downlink for the data processing mode uh, to, to, care, to calculate the actual results. It's interesting to note that what one has essentially is the response of the satellites to the total water columns. So it doesn't measure a single element, it measures the total response of all the water columns, both the, uh, the soil moisture, the ground moisture, and the surface moisture all interacting on that. And so the essential separation of these is point that's uh, uh, an analyst uh, utilization point of view that one goes forward on it. It's uh, also another point to note is that the satellite essentially senses the response of these particular elements at satellite altitude, but all the science is essentially done essentially on the surface of the Earth. So one has the uh, need for translating the gravity model determined at this altitude to the Earth's surface in order to get the actual science results you want. This leads to a downward continuation in which some of the errors in the long track direction at satellite altitude get amplified when one uses them on the surface of the Earth. And it's a, a factor that was, goes into a lot of the analysis that in the level two processing that we wrestle with. So the base objective of the mission was essentially to uh, 
collect a number of monthly solutions of, of, of this repeat fly, overfly of the surface of the Earth, create a time average or mean field by averaging this monthly set of solutions going forward, and then essentially use the monthly deviations from that mean field to capture the temporal variations of it. Um, the uh, uh, Representation of the signal was one of the uh, early uh, first light results that came out of the GRACE mission. And I don't know if it shows here, but there is a ground track in purple that runs across the Indian Ocean, goes ashore on the Indian continent here, crosses over the Himalayas, and then goes offshore in the, uh, in the uh, uh, North Sea area. And the three curves here essentially show, first of all, the bathymetry, and then the ground area topography as the satellites go over the mountains. Uh, the Himalayas and then drop back out. The gravity, surface gravity measurements that's related to this particular topographic path. And this particular uh, response is the satellite, inter-satellite range distance on the micron type level, showing essentially the satellite response here as the satellites encounter the continental shift, the response again as they encounter the Himalayas, and then again another response as they uh, drop off of the uh, sh uh, continental shelf in the northern hemisphere. So it's this type measurement that's uh, measured a long track, and over 30 days the ground tracks essentially overfly the surface of the Earth, so one gets a sufficiently dense sampling to allow the recovery, essentially, of the model for the gravity field. Um, the collection of the pattern that we've had is shown here. There was over 15 uh, years in orbits, and there's 163 uh, global gravity solutions, monthly gravity solutions that came out of this. We had a problem early on, right after we launched, in which we uh, lost one of the power straps on for one of the ultra-stable oscillators, and we're down a couple of months there, another anomaly with Star Tracker in, in 2003, and then ran for a period up through 2010 of getting every monthly solution going forward. Had a really uh, remarkable success. The mission essentially had a targeted five-year time frame, which would have uh, had it ending someplace in the time frame here, but was able to extend that over a factor of three. Someplace around 2010, uh, we began to have battery problems, and in 2011, they became sufficiently severe that we had to start shutting down the satellites every time the uh, orbit plane, which rotates with respect to the sun, goes through deep occultation. When the satellite is in deep shadowing, then the satellite couldn't operate. And so you can see that a couple of times per year, every 163 days, we actually shut down the satellites. Uh, in 2010-2011, uh, that stretched out a little bit in 2013. And so the, uh, the procedure essentially of uh, getting less accurate data. And the, as the battery uh, cells began to de de uh, degrade, we had less and less uh, um, ability to actually carry it forward all the way through the years. And in these years, we were dropping down three periods. Finally, uh, we uh, shut down to go through deep occultation in July of 2017 and wasn't able to recover it. So the mission actually ended on October of, uh, of 2017. And so the discussion we'll talk about essentially is to take a block of these to create the average, and we actually used up through 2011 in the uh, latest mean field that we're using over here because of some of the thermal problems in this, uh, in this particular group here. And then the uh, temporal variation would be uh, picked up by looking at the variability of the monthly solutions with respect to this mean. The uh, progress, I won't go through this, but it uh, points out a little bit of where we were. We had had a uh, couple, three decades of recommendations for gravity models at the time we uh, put this proposal in place. And the uh, best gravity no uh, model is essentially the line shown here. The satellite models essentially sit someplace in this region here, and the first uh, uh, essentially uh, 30 days of the gravity solution gave a model which we accepted down uh, fairly substantially. The first uh, 111 days uh, gave uh, this particular reduction, and the uh, first 14 months moved us down to this particular point here. This is beginning to be a couple of orders of magnitude over the uh, from the original solution, so there was really a substantial deficiency in the uh, gravity information at this longer wavelength time point at the time we started the mission. Uh, we've continued to do the reanalysis and the last uh, reanalysis of the data set as had both length and mission. Each one of these has more data in it and it also has the ability to learn what was wrong in what we were doing 
in the previous solution when we do the next one. And the calibration on this essentially uh, is, is uh, more or less validated by taking the next solution, which is much more accurate than the previous solution, doing the difference between those and do a calibration on it. So this essentially allows us to try to track this means uh, solution as we go forward. Uh, some, some of the earlier results that came out of this shows essentially the gravity uh, 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 improvement comparing the first 111 days with the pre-GRACE uh, uh, results and then the 14 months with pre-GRACE into the eye, you can see substantial improvement with just 111 days and then substantially more with the 14 months. And in terms of looking at what one could do with this, we had had an excellent uh, uh, altimeter-based uh, uh, mean sea surface that was to be used for trying to calculate the general ocean circulation, one of the gistrophic circulations out of the TOPEX mission. Uh, one really couldn't use it up through until we flew grace. The actual results from that mean sea surface using the EGM-96, which was the best surface model at that point, showed a little bit of the Arctic circumpolar current version, Antarctic circumpolar current, a uh, hint of the western boundary currents, very little in terms of equatorial current, countercurrent instruction. But with that, uh, essentially, that uh, first uh, 14 months of data, these uh, solution uh, popped out. This is one, I think, of the earlier results that uh, I think Don did when he was wrestling with the trying to get the uh, altimeter data going back out. But you can see that the information content in the altimeter, essentially roughly 10 years, was there not being able to use in comparison with the hydrography shown on the bottom. So one of the, uh, the steps, in, once we hit this point, we were pretty sure we were on the right direction. Now the procedure for going forward on this in the block form, uh, the way the results go forward, is we take the the data over flying the 14 months, essentially, this is the uh, inter-satellite range measurement, the accelerometer measurement, <clears throat> the uh, um, star tracker information for the orientation, and the GPS information for the positioning are collected on board each one of the satellites and downlinked into the data set. One guesses, essentially, the coefficients for a geopotential model, which essentially provides effectively the um, best knowledge that we have of the gravity model at the satellite altitude prior to the, uh, the uh, including the data set. One can get the acceleration components that for the satellite's uh, acceleration by taking the derivative of uh, this particular uh, potential in the uh, radial, the uh, uh, latitude and the longitude direction and use those essentially as acceleration inputs on the satellite. One can integrate the satellite's motion throughout the actual data collection period and compare effectively the predicted difference between the two satellites uh, based on a set of coefficients that's placed here with the measured distance coming down in the data set. And one then essentially goes through a process of adjusting those coefficients to make that prediction and uh, the predicted value of the satellite separation agree with the measurements going forward in a standard uh, data analysis procedure built around orbit determination. So effectively, one essentially then calculates corrections with this information and this a priori gravity model to this a priori model, adds those corrections in and gets the improved model. The actual overall integration has not only the effects of the gravity field, uh, the accelerometer data is added to it to get the effects of the surface forces, and it has background models for a number of uh, time-dependent uh, uh, effects. The uh, solid earth tides, ocean tides are well known. Uh, one doesn't want to estimate those. Uh, the rotational deformation is well modeled. And there is a high-frequency mass component associated with mass movement in the atmosphere. And so we actually use the uh, output of the ECMWF weather model total global weather model essentially uh, four times a day uh, as the representation of the mass movement for the atmosphere that forces essentially an ocean model and we get the ocean response to that mass movement as a background model to correct for this high frequency mass that essentially can't be observed with a 30 day overflight period. So essentially, uh, if going through this process, what one essentially estimates in the result of these coefficients is the signal, mass variation signal that we talked about before, plus any errors that we have in any of these background models. And so it's a great deal of concern to pay attention to those. And one of the things one can do 
is uh, when you get the data sets, looking at them, one can find obvious places where models may have been deficient. And essentially, the other point of contention is that we take this gravity results down, we continue it to the surface of the Earth and work effectively with equivalent water height, essentially as a function of latitude and, uh, and uh, longitude on the Earth's surface, where the uh, radius of the Earth's surface essentially is the value used for the R there. Uh, so this essentially procedure allows us to go forward with this. And, uh, the uh, mean model, I'll just mention this briefly, it's not the prime thrust of what we're essentially uh, uh, wanting to focus on, but we'll uh, look essentially at the fact that there has a, a satellite-only model created by just taking the GRACE data alone. There's a satellite-only model combining the GRACE data with the GOCHE data. The GOCHE uh, information is essentially much better at the higher degree. It actually allows us to extend that model out to 240, 240. The GRACE data is a little bit better than the GOCHI at the lower degree, and by putting these together, you get a very, very good uh, satellite-only model in terms of the wavelengths out to 240 by combining the two data sets. And then uh, the final combined model to get the best Earth model is obtained by taking the uh, the satellite only information arrays and combining it with the surface gravity measurements made up of altimeter data over the ocean and uh, land surface measurements that, that uh, one has tied into it. It's essentially uh, the DTU-13 was the one used in this particular set here at uh, Danish Technical University uh, uh, gravity anomalies in which uh, there is a DTU mean altimeter defined sea surface and the, uh, the EGM-2008 land data <coughs> over the land areas. The uh, uh, models are shown here. The satellite-only model uh, shows a, a, a fairly uh, significant uh, capturing of the Earth features that goes into it. The more accurate model uh, in the, uh, the, the one on the right is the combined model combining the surface gravity measurements with this information. The polar regions are very interesting regions because at the point this was going forward, there were deficiencies in the gravity measurements in the polar region, and a lot of the structure shown in the uh, total combined model at the polar region is based up on the Gauche and the uh, GRACE data measured in the polar regions. You can see from the satellite only, though, a number of the features. I'm not sure why this thing is looking so oblong there. But, uh, the, uh, but you see a number of the well-known features in the it does look well known. I'm not sure. This is not showing here. But in any event, uh, the uh, uh, we'll skip this going forward. I'm not sure what's happening to that evolution there. It's not round any longer, so it looks like it's migrating before. So it isn't showing on this computer. So it must be something in the transfer over there. But uh, the. Uh, 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 closed off on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge on this. There are a lot of the very large number of well-known features in the mean field that shows up here. They're captured with this one, but they're also captured with the satellite-only model as well. The other thing that we can do with this uh, data set is note that in the uh, uh, signals going across here, we get the annual signal showing forward. The decadal or trends are essentially obtained going from year to year going down. And in most of the results that, uh, that uh, uh, are shown uh, in the original modes regionally or globally, there's a very large uh, annual signal associ associated with the, uh, with the signal. We can actually put the temporal variability together to look essentially at the, uh, at the, com at the components uh, of the, uh, of the uh, Earth's exchange going into it. There is signal in the ocean. It doesn't show to me. I'm not sure how that's coming through there. It's a smaller scale, but it's a much smaller signal over the ocean because the uh, water effectively leaving the ocean and showing up on the land. The land area is much uh, smaller. Part of the water that goes into the atmosphere falls back into the ocean. Part of it makes it onto the land, and the transport mechanisms from the atmosphere determines how much of which goes forward on it. But this particular sequence of uh, monthly solutions essentially has been used to look at a number of important uh, uh, long-term trends, the sea level change being one of the major places where the gravity and the altimetry have interplayed, uh, looking at such things as ocean heat storage, uh, deep ocean currents, uh, the uh, polar and continental ice sheet change going into it. There is the mass of that measured directly by the, uh, the uh, uh, gravity-type measurements, but 
the gravity uh, essentially combined with the topography measurements from the altimeter essentially provides the more complete representation, and they, both of those benefit from the synthetic aperture radar measurements essentially uh, running the, uh, showing the discharge going into the ocean. There's also signals that show up on the land area for uh, total water storage on the land. Um, there are application-related areas of the science results that we have here in drought and uh, flooding events, uh, earthquake assessments, uh, water availability trends having to do with groundwater depletion. And one of the uh, really interesting developing results is the, uh, the number of investigating that are beginning to work on assimilating the gravity measurements into the modeling. This has been one of the points that when we first started looking at this some years ago, the actual mass representation in the models essentially was not paid very much attention to in some places and not right in the other places. But what we we'll, can take a look at essentially in the first stage is essentially add up all of the, uh, the changes over the ocean event and uh, add up all the changes over the land and effectively look at the signal of the ocean going to the land coming back in terms of this annual signal that we saw first represented on the uh, J2 version. And this allows us essentially to get a closure between uh, what's happening with the ocean and what's happening with the land. The uh, trend here effectively shows the strong annual signal. The amplitude is something on the order of uh, 2,500 gigatons of water plus or minus going into it, and it's equivalent to about a 10 millimeter sea level variation in the uh, trend it goes forward. It effectively uh, shows the growth in the, uh, in the uh, ocean commensurate with the loss of mass on the, over the overall land, and that loss of mass is mostly the, uh, the deposition of the uh, uh, ice sheets in the ocean. There's some land water affiliated with it, but it's predominantly the ocean ice sheets. And so again, this question shows a very interesting exchange in that particular component going forward, but it still raises the question of what, when, where, and, uh, and how does it go about doing it. And so we can take a look at some of the actual uh, regional trends by going into the maps and actually do the, uh, the, uh, the create the time trends from those. One essentially could add up all these trends over the ocean, over the land, and all of them over the ocean to get the result on the previous slide. But you'd note at each one of these places that we go forward, there is a strong annual signal. The annual signal in most places is much larger than the linear. The exception to that being in the uh, glacial regions where the, uh, there is a, a large mean signal. There is an annual signal there, but it's much smaller in the overall pictorial representation shown here. One can find a class of measurements going forward here. For instance, if you look at the places where one of the, uh, the uh, uh, early uh, demonstrations of the importance of the measurements was in trying to look at groundwater withdrawal in some of the large continental aquifers. And there was a, a very uh, interesting study that, uh, Solomon, uh, that uh, Swanson did uh, working with John War uh, in the state of Illinois in which they have a very well instrumented set of uh, well measurements and uh, surface measurements. And so one could essentially separate effectively the, uh, the groundwater aquifer from the soil moisture aquifer to try to get a validation on it. But looking essentially, using that uh, concept, one essentially uh, can look at the very large uh, groundwater depletion, say, in the China Plain. The one that uh, first came out on the various one was the one that um, Jay Famigetti and Matt Rodell did, looking at the, uh, at the uh, North India groundwater, large groundwater withdrawal. Uh, there's uh, depletion in the uh, uh, California uh, 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 San Joaquin Valley area. One sees also associated with this with uh, the drought areas, uh, the development of the drought and recovery in Texas, uh, the uh, essential uh, uh, groundwater depletion again in the uh, Taiga Euphrates Valley. There's uh, drought recovery uh, evident in southern uh, uh, Alaska. You can see the signal on the long-term trends from the map here. These represent the decade of hot trends going forward. But if one actually looks at the historical time frame, you can pick out the time in which the recovery occurred and the, uh, the extent to which it was carried forward. And so there's a great deal of information contained in these things. And this is just a snapshot of some of the things that one can look at in the temporal changes going forward. There are also signals of the episodic changes associated with the earthquakes, the Sumatran earthquake, the Tohoku earthquake, uh, the Chilean earthquake, are all evident in that. And one sees the thing that uh, these being episodic changes in the, um, in the solid earth, not the water related, but they show up in the pattern. 
We also get the, the uh, glacial isostatic adjustment changes over north uh, uh, over Canada and over uh, the, uh, Scandinavia. Uh, so the majority of the, uh, of the points we're looking at here really are the water related, but the solid earth signals are there as well in terms of it. So the, the, the point that is made, the measurement is set up and there's essentially detailed studies that individuals are doing with uh, all the points that goes into it. And as an example, we pick a couple of these to uh, uh, to look at, uh, at the role that the altimeter plays in the, in the uh, overall sea level recovery. Uh, the sea level uh, essentially, uh, essentially uh, is driven essentially by two uh, forcing functions. We know that if you heat water, it, uh, it in, uh, uh, volume increases. Also, if you add mass to it, the volume increases. And this is essentially is a repetition of, I think, a presentation that uh, that uh, Steve gave uh, at the Bowie lecture a few years, uh, Steve Neerham gave a few years ago, and I think Don also, Don Chambers also had a presentation that covered some of the points. But we'll look a little at the updated version of the results that go forward. Uh, there is essentially what is one of the better climate defined data records in the altimeter series. It represents effectively four missions, starting with TOPEX, Jason 1, Jason 2, Jason 3. They've all been implemented in a way in which there's overlap between every one of them, so one has good ties from one to the other. There's actually been an ongoing look at it to the point where I think just uh, Recently, I think uh, there's been some uh, determinations, one published by Steve and one published in France, of uh, correction to this earlier uh, time frame here. But this is a very well determined global mean sea level. The question comes into play, uh, what is the composition of the sea level? What version of it is temperature? What version of it is mass addition to it? Uh, GRACE effectively has the ability in principle to measure the mass from the mass changes in the ocean. It also has the ability to measure the mass loss essentially over the, uh, the uh, uh, frozen regions in the continents and con consequently one could be able to say something about a closure between the measured addition to the ocean and the measured loss from the land areas. And uh, we'll look a little bit at those in the subsequent slides. Uh, the other point is that the uh, mean sea surface essentially can allow one to do with the mean sea surface the same thing we did with the, uh, with the uh, altimeter data going into it. You can actually go into the various regions and measure the sea level change uh, from, from point to point. And the question could be raised globally what's causing the sea level rise in this in terms of temperature globally added and mass globally added. But is there a distribution of either mass being added or subtracted in a given region, and what is the temperature composition from that? Uh, the uh, first point on this is looking at the global mode going into it. The, uh, the, this is an updated result that uh, uh, Don has done in looking at the things in which he looks at the, uh, the uh, uh, thermosteric uh, data from the Argo buoys in the ocean. The, uh, GRACE measured mass components in the series here, uh, and then the total sea level change in the version going through here. If these two are the dominant two components going into sea level, in principle one could add the uh, temperature driven component to the mass driven component and recover sea level from that. And the actual uh, line shown on the version here uh, shows the, uh, the uh, GRACE plus the Argo, the little dotted line shows the versions of what one would get, and it gives a very good agreement with the uh, uh, actual total sea level measured by the altimetry. One has the ability of essentially use this in an inverted mode. In principle, one could subtract the grace mass from the, uh, the uh, total altimeter record to infer what the thermos, uh, thermosteric component would be, and so there's a possibility of inverting that process if there's a question about validation in either one of the others. In the same way, we're looking at it by taking the, uh, out, uh, the uh, uh, temperature data, uh, essentially, at the, uh, and overlapping with the uh, altimeter data and essentially creating effectively a mass component that could be used in terms of an extrapolation kind of a point going post this. So this has to do with trying to extrapolate grace forward to grace follow on. And so this, this point in terms of this global mode is a very interesting version. There's also the ability to calculate this mass, uh, what this mass would be by essentially adding up the uh, components from the glacial uh, components over the uh, Greenland and get essentially another way of essentially looking at it. So the ability to actually understand uh, what's going on on the, uh, on the global sea level uh, essentially is, uh, is very ripe for actually further exploitation. 
Uh, <clears throat> Looking at this regional version, there's a recent study and essentially uh, looking at one of the questions, it has to do with how much of the heat is stored in the upper uh, 2,000 meters, which is the range covered by the Argos buoy, and how much goes below that. In general, the results shown on the previous slide would suggest that there's not so very much because the results shown on the previous slide work uh, for the temperature component was obtained from this uh, 2,000 meter level. And it does show when added to the uh, mass uh, added uh, uh, mass estimated by Gray's closure with the altimeter measurement. This would suggest that there isn't very much in the deep ocean. But this particular study essentially takes a regional version as an exception to that global point and looks effectively at the uh, mass component essentially uh, uh, estimated uh, by Grace for this particular region and the uh, total sea level estimated for the altimeter. And by differencing those, there's a uh, a, a trend indicating that in this particular region there is a deep warming trend going on. That there is an atmospheric interaction locally that's causing a mixing mode that's actually depositing uh, water below it. This is essentially the conclusion reached in it. So uh, there's a possibility of a number of these sort of studies that actually allows one to go in and actually penetrate some of these questions and look forward on them. Uh, the uh, other place that there's an interesting point going on was a claim from the GRACE mission that we'd be able essentially to take the gravity measurements and essentially get pressure variations at the ocean bottom and with those pressure variations use the geostrophic uh, uh, circulation patterns for the deep ocean currents. The, uh, this is essentially the ocean representation representing the results that we've had before and it shows effectively the, <coughs> the uh, 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 ocean bottom pressure variations that one has uh, going forward in terms of it. Uh, the uh, 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 results here have been used been com uh, compared with a number of tide gauge measurements that are uh, that are set oh, I've been reading this wrong, that are set forward in terms of this basis and uh, the uh, conclusion essentially I'm going to have to I'd set this down. This was a very interesting uh, early example that John War and uh, you know, Jamie Marson and, um, uh, did in trying to look effectively at using the ocean bottom pressure gauges to inverse circulation up in the northern planet, the uh, northern and the uh, uh, polar regions. Uh, it's very difficult. This shows the difficulty going forward on that. Effectively, the bottom pressure gauges are set down by virtue of dropping this through the bottom and uh, essentially looking at the results. Bottom line quickly shows that essentially the pressure results uh, uh, essentially run through the first uh, part of the mission with the early solution. There's a reversal going forward on it and some later results that, uh, that uh, 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 the, the group came forward with over here picked up this reversal and kind of used this essentially to uh, go forward with a really interesting uh, result. Uh, that uh, a setup showing that the fresh water coming into the region over here, essentially the normal pattern uh, transports it out into the uh, Atlantic Ocean, but there was a, a cyclonic uh, a rotation set up that picks the water up, brings the water back around, and deposits the fresh water going into it. And this is done essentially by extending the uh, few pressure gauges that were there in terms of using the grace for bottom pressure, so it shows one of the interesting places that one could go forward and I haven't been paying attention to the time, so I'm going to skip forward with this. This shows essentially the ability to actually use the GRACE to go into the actual continental regions and actually measure the individual ice contributions from essentially the eight, uh, uh, seven particular regions. It gives the total uh, uh, land surface area, excluding uh, the uh, Greenland and the Antarctic region. And uh, if one then adds that together, one essentially is able to add the total results together to get the total uh, mass contribution and the acceleration rates for the signals in uh, Antarctica, Greenland, and the GIC, and compare that against the uh, overall measurement version going forward on it. So uh, there's one other version in terms of this uh, thing that we'd like to look at. The ability of actually take the data in the models it allows you essentially to disaggregate the total water column into the, <clears throat> uh, 
into the uh, essentially the surface water, the uh, soil moisture, and the groundwater going forward on that. And this is an important point in trying to make the grace data available for some of the land surface agriculture uses, which wants essentially better spatial resolution and would really like to know those components going forward. Uh, this essentially is one that uh, Matt Rodell has put together, essentially showing the actual uh, grace measurements that we showed earlier with the land data simulation in terms of the tre uh, terrestrial water storage going forward in terms of it. And he's actually been able to validate this with a number of global wells to actually come up with the solution going forward. And I think I'm going to have to skip these in terms of the time element going forward. The question that we noted in terms of it is if it's, if it's climate related, then the um, need for continuity is extremely important. And uh, we actually have online a continuity bridge method in GRACE follow on to bridge until the uh, GRACE 2 measurement that the decade survey set for us launched on May 22nd on orbit. And we've essentially got the first results going forward in terms of it. There was a much better presentation on this presented by the GRACE follow on earlier this afternoon. But this shows essentially the GRACE results in June 2016, GRACE follow-on results in June 2018. There's a great deal of similarity between them. We think that effectively the uh, line's been picked up. So in the summary then, in the conclusions then, the, you would note that uh, mass change is an important component in trying to look at Earth's uh, system interactions. The uh, uh, multi-decade mass measurements that confirm important climate trends and the continuation of measurement is important for future Earth system studies. And, Sorry I ran long. Thank you. <clears throat> Andrew, I think we have time for one or two questions, if anybody has any questions. I actually have a question, Byron. You mentioned that the altimetry missions all had some overlap uh, in, in their measurement. There wasn't an overlap between GRACE and GRACE follow-on. How important do you think it is that the mission after GRACE follow-on has some overlap? And what will that mean for the accuracy of the record? Long term. Well, I think it's critical. We, uh, the Academy, put out a report on requirements for continuity of climate related measurements, and uh, tying the records together from mission to mission was deemed an critically important factor. Uh, we worked very hard to try to get at least uh, a touch of from grace to grace follow on. Originally, we wanted to follow on, circumstances conspired to keep that from happening. It's an issue that we're going to spend a lot of time wrestling with now, trying to look at essentially tying together. The plan is essentially to take a look at the grace measurements extrapolated, the uh, grace following measurements extrapolated back, but pick some of the really important climate trends and try to make a case for using the climate trends overlapping grace and grace follow on and the climate trends that have additional measurements such for instance as this uh, sea level thing we talked about you can get a mass measurement from the Argo and from the altimeter measurement itself there's a number of places on land area where ground trends in, uh, in large water basins essentially have other measurements that essentially are there and carrying forward and so we'd want to use this to try to build that measurement in place and so the answer in a generic question is we're very concerned about it. We're going to spend a lot of time working with it. We hope that we can put the requirement that there will be overlap of the next two measurements. It, it gives you the bid from doing an in situ calibration. It also gives you the chance to get additional information. We had talked a little bit about at one point when the possibility of getting overlap was there, of trying to get an interleave measurement similar to what the altimeters have done. After they've done their calibration, they've moved the, the one altimeter into another plane, pick up new information to supplement the other. So it's very important for climate continuity type measurements. Uh, it's at climate models at the present time, no. Uh, it's one of the kind of frustrations to us that you don't see that going into it. The results I showed in this modeling here is a land data simulation model. It's done mostly for fitting, although there are predictions being done with that model now because short term forecast is an important weather related event and it will be for the sorts of things and societal uses of this particular data here. So I think that at least in the prediction, short term prediction mode, that will, that's already happening in, in terms of this version here. The next question is how it gets addressed in terms of the long term uh, climate issues, but we're not there yet.
So change from a biannual into an annual signal this time in your clock. Why is that? I don't know. <laughs> um, it's, there's a whole set of interesting questions in that version, I think, that we would want to want to wrestle with on that. I'll chat with you about this later. We haven't gone into it. There is one more question, I think. Yeah. I seem to recall that uh, some time in the past, uh, the inability to control aliases and tides in the space of the space of the space of the tide issue is one that we've uh, we, that we're looking at. It's one of the big ticket items, and one of the flags that we've put on the results for this release 07, this final best and final analysis to look at the tide model. We've got an effort underway now to try to begin looking at the tuning of the tide model. The uh, a uh, group in Europe at, at the Technical University of Graz essentially has actually done a tide model evaluation going in terms of, and it's possible that the tide models can be adjusted with the GRACE data. We're going to take a look at that issue going forward. Uh, this may give the best tide model for removing the tide signal from the GRACE measurements. It may or may not work for the localized uh, tide results going into it. I don't know, but it, the prime concern we have is how the actual tide model records we have influence and, as you say, degrade some of the results that we put out, and that'll be an issue that we'll be looking at in reanalysis. <clears throat> Uh, yes, there's a, clearly the, one of the big problems that we've had for most of the applications is the spatial resolution inadequacies. And so we continually, every time we do a solution, the first thing we do is look at the improved spatial resolution. But it's only marginal there. It's not close to, the, to the, the, where we need to be. The improvement from spatial resolution, from my point of view, comes not so much from improving the precision of the measurement, but from improving the constellation mode. We really need more dense... Uh, well, the trade between spatial resolution and temporal resolution is a trade-off on that. You can get better spatial resolution, but the temporal resolution suffers. You can get better temporal resolution, but the spatial resolution suffers. And so th the only way that you can beat that is by putting more constellations up there. And I think either by getting multinational participation to bring missions online in which each nation brings a pair of satellites and puts them up there, or conversely, by it's finding a way to miniaturize the actual measurement technology to get it down to the point where we can do it on smaller satellites, that probably are the two places where the biggest hope for getting over the spatial temporal resolution comes from. I think we have to wrap it up because we have to give the next session time to come in. So I'd like to thank Byron one more time.